Trigger warning. The following episode contains certain events that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. The man pushed Sophia hard. She didn't understand what was happening and she looked terrified. Mommy! Daddy! She screamed. Madison's heart went out to her daughter and her eyes filled with tears. That was only a warning. I advise you to cooperate with us. Otherwise, your daughter will bear the consequences. The man who had hurt Sophia sneered and said to Madison. His threat was enough to stifle Madison's resistance. She stopped struggling and watched helplessly as her daughter cried. Outside, Ian was bursting with rage. His daughter, the little princess of the Weston family, was in the hands of a criminal gang. She had never been treated like that before and Ian was determined that they would pay the price for that act. He was so angry at that moment that he wanted to kill them, and nothing would stop him from getting Madison and Sophia back. He desperately forced his way through the crowd and toward the van, but as he got near, the shutter slowly fell toward the counter. At the same time, the van started moving, leaving Ian behind. The van moved slowly at first, but the crowd of people on the sidewalk prevented Ian from gaining any ground on it. It soon gathered speed and approached a crossing, where several children and parents were walking across the road. The van showed no signs of stopping, and the people started screaming as they tried to get out of its path. Inside the van, Madison and Sophia could see the people scattering, and they heard a dull thud as at least one person was hit by the speeding van. Ian watched the chaotic scene and realized that the van wasn't going to stop for anything. He made a quick decision and ran toward his car, which was parked nearby. Move! Move! He shouted at the people who were blocking his path. Sophia was so scared by what she had just seen that she stopped crying and looked horrified as she wondered whether any of her classmates had been hit by the van. Madison tried to stay focused on her daughter and she thought about how she could keep her safe. She could see that the little girl was shocked by what she had seen through the windshield. Sophia, look at Mommy. Quickly, look at Mommy, she ordered, hoping that she could divert her attention from the horror. Sophia looked at Madison, who was trapped on the counter. The little girl's normally bright eyes were devoid of luster, and Madison longed to hug her and give her some reassurance. My poor little girl. No five-year-old should have to witness this kind of cruelty and violence, she thought. She hoped that her daughter wouldn't experience any lasting psychological trauma after the experience. Sophia, be good and look at Mommy. Mommy is with you so you don't need to be afraid. She wanted to hold her and prevent her from looking out of the window. The driver was driving recklessly, and Madison was worried that more pedestrians would be mown down. She knew that Sophia needed not to see any of those terrifying images. Mommy will always protect you, so don't be afraid, she repeated. Ian got into his car, stepped on the gas pedal, and headed in the direction of the candy van. He wasn't the only person giving chase. Several other drivers had witnessed the scene on the crossing, and they had followed the van while phoning the police. Some of Ian's men were also chasing the van. One of the men in the van spotted the cars behind them. Drive slowly so that we can play with them, he ordered. We'll put on a show for them. The driver slowed down, allowing the other cars to catch up with them. However, he didn't let the other cars pass him because he was wary of being boxed in by them. Madison's face was pale, but she still tried her best to smile and hold Sophia's attention. The skinny man who was holding Sophia let go of her and the little girl ran to her mother and wrapped her arms around her neck. Madison cried and hugged her tightly while giving her reassurance. It's okay. Mommy is here for you. You're being a very brave girl, she spoke. Sophia didn't feel brave. She was scared out of her mind. If she had been less scared, she would have cried, but she was still too worried about the fact that her ordeal wasn't over. Her mind was filled with the images of the pedestrian shocked expressions, and she could still hear the children's screams. It's my fault for wanting candy. If I hadn't begged Mommy and Daddy for candy, this wouldn't have happened. Why did I have to be so greedy? 
she thought. Sophia hoped that nobody had been badly hurt because she felt that she was responsible for what had happened. She didn't understand why she and her mother had been taken by the bad men. But she knew that they wouldn't have been at the candy van if she hadn't kept on asking for candy. It's all my fault, she thought. The shutter had been lowered halfway, and the man holding Madison leaned over the counter and gave a mocking smile as he watched Ian's car draw alongside the van. Ian clenched his jaw and his eyes were so angry that they looked as if they could shoot out fire. Mr. Weston, you and the others need to stay back, the man shouted. After he spoke, he pulled Madison's clothes tightly with one hand and pushed her onto the counter. When Madison felt the air rushing past her, she was terrified and wanted to let out a scream, but she held back for the sake of Sophia, whom she was still holding tightly. Half of Madison's body was out of the van. Her eyes were staring down at the rapidly flowing pavement beneath her. The van was moving so fast that the road markings were a blur as they passed across her vision. As she was pushed out further, she realized that if the man holding her loosened his grip, she would fall onto the road and under the wheels of the cars following them. She hugged Sophia tighter and felt the wind stinging her face. Her hair was flying wildly and her eyes were watering. As she held Sophia, her body stiffened. At that moment, the lives of her and her daughter were literally in the hands of the man who was gripping her clothes. Ian flickered his eyes between the van and the road ahead. He was frustrated at being so close and yet unable to do anything to protect the ones who were the most precious to him. He looked angrily at the man who was holding his wife, and his look told the man that he would hunt him down, wherever he hid. Not knowing what else to do, he maneuvered his car closer to the van so that he could speak to Madison. Madison! he shouted. It wasn't easy for Madison to raise her head, but she managed to lift it enough to see Ian. Don't be afraid, I'm here he said. She looked helplessly at the face that was so close to her, but was effectively far away, and she felt even more helpless. Out of sight of Sophia, she allowed herself to shed a few tears. Ian's heart softened, and it ached for them as he saw the fear in their eyes. Madison remained silent. She was afraid that if she uttered a single word, she would be dropped onto the road. She prayed that the man's hand wouldn't tire, and that the van wouldn't lurch and make him lose its grip. The drivers behind Ian were all frightened when they saw Madison and Sophia being pushed out, and they positioned their cars at the side of the road and dropped back a little. They were afraid that if the man let go of Madison, she and Sophia would be killed under the wheels of their cars. However, they were determined not to lose sight of the van, so they kept what they thought to be a safe distance. The man who was holding Madison took off his hat, revealing his balding head and said proudly, Mr. Weston, you're supposed to be very powerful, aren't you? If that's the case, how did you let this happen? It looks like you slipped up. Ian held his breath and glared at the man, but couldn't think of anything to say. The kidnapping was planned well in advance. The kidnappers had been confident of their success because it had been done in daylight and in front of hundreds of witnesses. Ian felt like an idiot for allowing it to happen. He could see that the man was very strong because he was holding Madison with one hand while his other hand was gripping the counter. Like Madison, Ian prayed that nothing would happen to make the man lose his grip. The man could tell that Ian didn't understand what was happening, so he started to fill in some details. You were very helpful to Hades. Didn't you think there would be some consequences for that? You should have been expecting something like this to happen. Ian still didn't respond, so the man decided to goad him to get a response. My name's Doug, by the way. You might recognize my other name, Jaguar. I've taken a liking to your wife, and I think the rest of the gang will like her too. But they'll have to wait in line. If she manages to survive, I'll send her back to you, and she can tell you all about it. As for your daughter... In the eyes of my boss, she shouldn't exist. She's no use to me, so I don't need to say any more. His words made Ian's blood boil. He carefully positioned his car close to the van while scanning the road ahead. Let them go, 
and I'll give you whatever you want, he offered. Jaguar laughed wildly and said, I'm a gangster and not a businessman. I steal the things I want, and I don't make deals with people. You can't negotiate your way out of every situation. You worked with someone who spied on me for years, and you must pay the price for that. Go home and make the funeral arrangements. For the first time, his tone revealed his anger. Madison shivered as she listened to him, and she felt that her situation was hopeless. As she tightened her grip on her daughter, she saw a small truck in front of them. It was carrying hay bales. Madison saw an opportunity and knew that it was time to act. She had heard what Jaguar had said about Sophia and believed that the little girl would be killed by the gang if she didn't get away. She put her mouth close to Sophia's ear and whispered, Treasure, go back home with Daddy and wait for Mommy. I'll be back very soon, but you must listen to Daddy and be good. Because she didn't want Jaguar to hear, her voice was very soft. It was so quiet that it was blown away by the wind as she spoke, and she didn't know whether Sophia had heard it or not. She looked at her daughter's face, which had lost its vigor, and her heart ached. She then looked across at Ian and saw that his eyes were filled with fear. He was holding the steering wheel tightly and wanted to shout some encouragement, but there was nothing else he could do to help them. There was a screech of brakes as the candy van slowed down to avoid the truck carrying the hay bales, Jaguar was distracted for a moment, but he didn't release his grip on Madison's clothes. The candy truck had slowed down considerably, and it lurched to the left to get past the truck. When she saw the hay bales next to the van, Madison gave Sophia a big kiss and threw her onto the back of the slow-moving truck. Even though they were moving relatively slowly, it was still an extremely dangerous action. But Madison felt that it was the only way that she could save her child from certain death. She was relieved to see that Sophia had landed on the hay bales and hadn't fallen onto the road. The driver of the truck looked shocked, and he immediately braked and pulled over to the side of the road. A couple of the cars that had been in pursuit of the van also stopped. Sophia was taken to the hospital, and Francis and Paul were soon notified. The candy van sped up again, and Ian put his foot on the gas pedal to keep up with it. The other cars also drew closer to the van. Jaguar was annoyed that he had been outsmarted by Madison. He fiercely pulled her back into the van and made her stand up. He then raised the shutter completely so that Ian could see what was happening. When he was sure that Ian was watching, he hurt Madison. I expect you're pleased with yourself, but you've sealed your fate now. That's the last time you'll see your daughter, he snarled. Get your hands off her, Ian shouted after seeing his wife hurt. He once again tried to maneuver closer to the van. He was afraid that if he allowed it to get away, he would never see Madison again. By this time, the candy van was being driven at great speed. It had been modified to allow it to travel so fast. Although Ian was driving a high-end car, which was also capable of reaching a high speed, he was struggling to keep up with the van. His entire body was shaking, but he still pressed down hard on the gas pedal, pushing his car to its limits. He looked in the rear rear mirror and saw that the cars behind him were now just specked. When the others finally caught up with Ian's car, it was parked at the side of the road, and the candy van was nowhere in sight. Ian was standing next to his car making phone calls. Check all the CCTV footage in this area and find out where that van went. He barked into his phone. The van had outpaced Ian's car and Madison had been lost. Ian knew that he had to find out as soon as possible where the kidnappers had taken her. He had already seen Jaguar's torture, and he expected that she would receive much worse as soon as they arrived at their destination. When the Weston family received the news of the kidnapping, Olivia slammed the table in anger and looked at her husband for help. Unbelievable, Edward shouted before making a call. Daniel called on his men to search for her, 
and Cassandra informed Shane about the news. Shane immediately headed to the Weston's mansion, and Hades also joined them. Everyone met in the living room where Ian was already sitting on the couch, feeling frustrated and angry. Cassandra knew that she couldn't help in the search for Madison, so she went up to Sophia's room to see how she was doing. The child had been bruised when she had landed on the hay bales. She got scratches on her body. She had been taken out of the hospital and brought to the Weston's house by Francis and Paul. Since returning from the hospital, she had been in a deep sleep, which was partially induced by her medication. Cassandra stayed by her side and stroked her arm. The group that was assembled in the living room planned their response, and each of them was given some responsibilities. Shane was asked to use his work connections to gather information. He told them that he would also involve his father, who still had several contacts in the police department. As they were discussing their roles, Jason barged into the living room. When he saw Ian, his anger flared up and he punched him. If you can't look after her, you don't deserve to have her, he shouted. Ian was knocked to the ground by the punch. Shane and Daniel went to pick him up, but Ian pushed them away. He then stood up and started fighting with Jason. The others looked on in horror as the two men released all their pent-up resentment toward each other. You put her in danger and didn't bother to protect her. You're useless, Jason shouted. When she comes back, she can stay with me. I'll give her what you can't. Jason's words were like needles stabbing into Ian's heart. He knew that he had let Madison down and that she would probably lose her sense of security with him. This time, she had even had to endure seeing their daughter terrified. He would have given anything not to have let that happen, and he had tried to be vigilant. However, Madison was a free person, and he hadn't been able to keep her locked up with no contact with the outside world. Ian knew that many malevolent forces were working against him, and they would take any opportunity they were given. The two men were pommeling each other, but Ian didn't say a word in his defense. As the fight continued, Zack walked in. He was also angry with Ian for allowing Madison to be taken. And if he hadn't seen Jason and Ian fighting, he might have punched Ian too. That's enough. I don't have time to fight with you. What's important right now is finding Madison. We can finish this another time, Ian said. When Ian was released, he continued... I want you all to use your connections to keep an eye on every road. If anyone sees a candy van, follow it. You all have the license plate number of that van. Daniel, arrange for additional surveillance of Weston Group's building in all my properties. I suspect that they will make a move soon. As the orders were given, Ian gave off the aura of an army general. Ask Cassandra to take care of Sophia for me. Shane... I want you to protect them and stop anything from happening to Sophia. Also, Hades, your identity has been exposed, so you must be careful. I don't want you to get involved in this. Ian told everyone except Jason and Zack what he expected of them. Zack didn't need his orders. He would find Madison in his own way. Jason, on the other hand, was disgusted with Ian and wouldn't take orders from him. Just as they were about to begin their assignments... Cassandra came into the room and told them that Sophia was awake. When everyone went into her room, they saw that she was sitting up in bed, looking blankly at the ceiling. Her normally bright eyes had lost their sparkle and were lifeless, and she didn't pay any attention to her visitors. Olivia's heart ached as she hugged her, and her eyes filled with tears. Sophia, your grandma is here. You're a very brave girl, and I'm proud of you. Everyone took their turn to talk to her, but no matter who spoke or hugged her, she didn't respond. She gave no words or gestures, and she looked like a lifeless doll. Ian was scared by her frozen state. He held her in his arms and said, Sophia, you're at Grandma and Granddad's house. Aunt Cassandra is going to look after you while I get Mommy. Everything's going to be okay. Sweetie, say something to me. No matter how much he urged her, she didn't say anything. Her only reaction was to glance at him. The family doctor was in the room and he didn't look happy. He felt that she should have stayed in the hospital. The Westons had been afraid that she wouldn't be safe there, so they had brought her back. They'd hoped that the familiarity of her room would make her feel better. 
but now it seemed that she wasn't even aware of where she was. Olivia looked anxiously at the doctor and wanted to ask his advice. The doctor noticed her looking at him and said, She's had a terrible shock, and it could take her a while to recover from it. I would have preferred to see her remain in the hospital in case there were any complications from the bump to her head. But I understand your concerns. The best thing you can do is to keep her in a calm environment and give her lots of reassurance. They all wished that they could give her some good news about her mother, which would have been the best therapy at that moment. It was late in the evening at the Weston's mansion. Olivia was guarding Sophia, and she didn't dare to take her eyes off her. She was afraid that something would happen to her precious granddaughter if she weren't careful. The other members of the Weston family had been busy for the entire day. Ian was in his study. He was holding a lit cigarette, and the room was filled with the smell of smoke. He hadn't smoked the cigarette, but just let it burn. He rarely smoked when he was with Madison, and never smoked around Sophia. It was only because he was feeling stressed that he had reached for a cigarette, but he had been too preoccupied to smoke it. As he sat at his desk, he was remembering what Jaguar had said about his wife, and how the gang would be waiting in line to spend time with her. He hoped that Jaguar had only said it to provoke him. The thought of those men touching his wife disgusted him. He desperately wanted to find Madison, and everyone was trying to come up with a way to trace her. However, despite all their efforts, they hadn't found any leads. Zack tapped on Ian's door and walked in. He frowned when he saw the smoke in the room. After sitting down on the couch, he said, We'll take care of this. You should take a back seat. Ian scoffed at Zack's suggestion, but Zack wasn't annoyed by the reaction. He had expected that he would resist the idea. You're too emotional at the moment, and I'm worried that you will act rashly and put her at risk. That's not a criticism. I understand how you must feel, but we need to tackle this calmly, Zack explained. Ian's jaw was tight as he sat silently and took in what Zack had said. Zack gave Ian a stern look. It's not only Jaguar, it's also Sue. What are you planning to do with her? He asked. We all know what kind of personality Madison has, and we know what kind of personality you have. Can you guarantee that when you meet Sue, you'll hold back and not shoot her? I very much doubt it. Ian glared at him but didn't speak. Zack stood up. I'll leave you to think about it. He walked to the door and continued. You mustn't do it. You might want revenge for your mother and father, but you need to think about your wife and daughter. You should stay away from Sue and leave this matter to us. We'll save Madison. Ian didn't respond and he watched Zack leave. How can I not save my wife? The idea of me standing back and doing nothing is inconceivable. Sue killed my parents and now she's threatening my wife. Does anyone think that I'll let her get away with that? He thought. He took a deep breath, picked up his phone and made a call. He then took his coat and walked out. Ian, stop right there, Edward shouted as Ian strode past the living room. Ian stopped, but he didn't look at Edward. Where are you going? Edward asked as he stepped out of the room and stood in front of Ian. He looked alarmed and stern. Ian said calmly, Dad, I'm going to save Madison. Nonsense, his father roared. Edward knew that the most important thing right then was to save Madison. He also knew that because Sue was involved, it wasn't going to be easy. How can you save her when you want to kill Sue? You won't negotiate with her. Furthermore, she's not the only person holding Madison. There's also Jaguar and his many subordinates. You can't save her by going in guns blazing. This needs to be left to people who can act rationally. Ian felt frustrated that his father was trying to persuade him to back down. Edward tried his best to calm some of Ian's emotions. He said, Ian, you must believe us. We will save Madison. They have her now, but they'll contact us. We just need to wait for them to do that. You need to protect your wife and daughter. 
and the only way you'll do that is by negotiating with them. Ian wasn't happy to accept that he should back down. He already felt bad that Madison had been taken because he hadn't been more proactive, and he hated the idea that Sue was controlling the situation. Dad, it's nighttime now, and we haven't heard a whisper from them. How can we be sure they'll get in touch? They will, Edward promised. They took Madison as a bargaining chip. Otherwise, they'd have killed her when they had her in the van. But Dad, Madison is waiting for me. I expect she is. But the most important thing is that she gets out alive, Edward said. Ian was afraid that something would happen to his wife. He was in a tricky situation. Before he helped Hades, he thought that as long as he arranged for extra protection for her, nothing would happen to her. Yet she had still been taken away right under his nose. He didn't want to experience that again. He remembered the despair in her eyes when she had thrown Sophia out of the van. He believed that Madison would only be safe if Sue were dead. I can't sit back and do nothing, Ian said to his father. It's not in my nature. Edward looked disappointed, but he didn't say anything else to persuade his son. After leaving the Weston's house, Ian went straight to his car. His eyes were filled with murderous intent. As his car sped along the road, he called Francis. Francis had just found Sue's whereabouts and he texted the location to him. Before Ian could look at the address, his phone rang. It was Madison. When he saw the name on his phone, he almost lost control of the car. He quickly brought it to a stop at the side of the road. His hands trembled as he picked up the phone, and he tried very hard to steady his breathing. Hello? He said. Ah, ah. He heard a burst of laughter, followed by Sue's voice. She said, Mr. Weston, are you agitated and anxious? What did you think when you saw that the call was from Madison? Were you expecting to hear her voice? Or did you think I was calling to tell her that she's already dead? Ian's body was shaking as he asked, Where is she? Sue laughed and said, What a dumb question. Do you think I'm going to tell you so soon? We haven't even negotiated yet. And Jaguar has his reasons for taking her. I just wanted to give you a call from Madison's phone to let you know that I'm in control of this. Just in case you had any doubts. Tell me what you want, he demanded. Sue knew what he was feeling, and she laughed at his discomfort. Someone will contact you when the time is right. By the way, I forgot to tell you that I also arranged for Bruce to be with her. Since you're going to settle things, we might as well do it properly. What do you think? Ian held the steering wheel tightly. Over the previous five years, he had learned to temper his emotions. However... When it came to Madison, he would occasionally lose control. Right then, he was finding it difficult to stay on top of his rage, and he couldn't help himself from sounding out of control as he said, I'm warning you, you better not touch her. Otherwise, I'll make you wish you were dead. The threat that he had uttered through gritted teeth seemed to have had some power, and Sue was silenced by it. He ended the call and stepped on the gas pedal, heading straight to the address that Francis had sent. Sue didn't know why, but when she heard his threat, she shivered. She had never been afraid of him before. After she found out that he had fallen in love with her daughter, she had become even more determined to harm him. However, his threat to make her wish she were dead had cut through. Her grip on the phone tightened, and she breathed heavily while trying to calm her emotions. When she regained her composure, she threw away the phone and slapped the man who was standing behind her. He was tanned and had a deep scar on his face. Idiot. Why hasn't Jaguar made a move yet? You said that he would act. Madison has been in his hands for several hours, so why hasn't he done anything yet? The tan man looked down and didn't answer. Sue shouted angrily, Get out of here, you useless piece of trash. I'll sort this out myself. After saying that, she walked into her closet and the man left. After about 20 minutes, she finished changing her clothes and was about to come out when she heard a loud banging on the door of her room. She walked out angrily, but before she could say anything, someone grabbed her by the collar. She was surprised to see that it was Ian.
Sue couldn't believe that Ian had found her. How could he have found me? Hardly anyone knows where I am, she thought. He tightened his hand to hold her, and she grabbed his hand to try to make him let go. Ian was glad to be in the position he had dreamed of being in for many years. I hope I'm hurting you. He growled as he held her. She wanted to look angry, but she was overwhelmed by fear. As she stared at him, she wondered how she had allowed him to get the upper hand. Right then, he could easily kill her. He was six feet two inches tall with a muscular body, and was capable of killing a man much taller and stronger than Sue. Sue was alone, having sent away the man with the scar. Ian, on the other hand, had backup from Francis and others, who were about to arrive. When Francis walked into Sue's room, he looked worried. If Ian kills, or maims Sue, his relationship with Madison will be finished, he thought. Sue tried her best to speak to Ian. Stop this. I'm Madison's mother. Are you sure you want to do this to me? She said. She looked at Ian's mouth, which was forming a mocking smile. At the same time, his eyes grew more murderous. So, you remember that you have a daughter, do you? Tell me where she is. Otherwise, I can't guarantee that I won't kill you right now. After letting her struggle for a while, he said... He emphasized the last four words. Not only Sue, but even Francis and the others who had arrived could see that Ian meant what he said. Francis hoped that Sue would reveal Madison's location... If she didn't, both the mother and her daughter would probably end up dead. Sue's face was turning very red. It seemed that she was unable to talk, so Ian put her onto the couch. Are you going to tell me, or do I have to start again? He asked. Sue looked into his eyes and gave a cold laugh. He was annoyed by her laughter. His anger was growing. Tell me, he shouted at her again. Ian was frustrated by her stubbornness. He had no qualms about killing her, but he first wanted to hear where Madison was. She looked up at him and said, I won't tell you, so you'll never find her. Even if you do, the others will be long gone, and you'll only have her dead body. At least you'll have something to bury, but that'll be your only comfort you won't ever. Before she could finish, Ian shouted, Tell me, damn you, or I'll be burying you, and I won't even wait until you're dead. For the first time, Francis was frightened by Ian. Even though he had been with him for many years, he had never seen him like this before. He wished that they could have gone to Madison's location without involving Sue. Sue started to look worried. Ian's threats had found their mark, but she still didn't crack. If anything happens to Madison... I'll make you wish you were dead, Ian muttered. You need to tell me where she is before they harm her. The sooner you tell me, the more chance there is that you won't die a slow and painful death. Sue bit her lip tightly for a long time and remained quiet. As she lay on the floor, she shook violently. Ian looked down at her. You should be glad that you gave birth to Madison. Otherwise, I would have killed you a long time ago. Sue's face was so pale that she looked as though she were about to pass out. For a long time, Ian didn't say anything. He just looked at her from above with eyes full of coldness. Francis found it hard to breathe. He knew that the clock was ticking for Madison. He thought kidnappers would try to contact Sue. If she didn't answer the call, they would assume that something had happened to her and would kill Madison. It was even possible that Sue had arranged to go to the place where Madison was being held. If she didn't arrive, they would become suspicious and they might kill her in panic. When Ian's patience was almost at an end, he received a call from Paul, who had some new information. After getting the call, Ian left without hesitation. Francis waved his hand and someone grabbed Sue. They all followed Ian. In a rural area just outside the city, there was a small abandoned house with no other houses for several miles around. The normally empty house was full of activity. Several people had gathered there, and they were all drinking. 
A strong smell of alcohol pervaded the whole of the building. In a small back room, Madison and Bruce were tied up. Madison had been unconscious for a while, but she was finally coming around. When she realized that she was tied up, she became tense. She could hear the clink of glasses and snatches of conversations coming from the next room. If I catch Hades, I'll take out his organs and feed them to the dogs. So will I. I can't believe that the boss I looked up to for all those years is a cop. Now that the police know who we are, things are going to get more difficult for us. Damn him. I can't believe that I was fooled by the man. I don't feel like I can trust anyone after that. Madison could tell that the men in the next room were drinking. From the way that they were raising their voices and slurring their words, it seemed that they had drank quite a lot. She quickly woke Bruce, who was beside her. The two of them nervously looked at the flimsy door in front of them and could see that it could be kicked open with a light kick. Although they were tied up in a difficult situation, they felt strengthened by the presence of each other. Because Ian Weston dared to help Hades, I'll take great pleasure in touching his woman. If it wasn't for Doug saying that he would be the first one to touch her, I would have been in there already. The wife of a Weston is a good catch for us. I want Ian Weston to beg me to leave her alone. The others laughed at the man's wish. Madison's face turned pale, and Bruce moved between her and the door. Madison had a warm feeling when she saw Bruce trying to protect her. Their hands and legs were tied, and they couldn't stand up. They could only sit on the floor and shuffle around on their buttocks. One of the men decided to check on the prisoners. When he walked into the room, Bruce spun around and managed to bring the man down. Madison stayed behind Bruce. She was determined not to let the men touch her. The sound of the scruffle attracted the attention of some of the other men. The ones who were less drunk went into the small room. When they saw what had happened, they beat up Bruce. There were several of them, and Bruce was still tied up, so there was nothing he could do to defend himself. When they were done beating him up, they went back to their drinking den. Bruce, are you all right? Madison asked as she shuffled up to him. Even in the dim light, she could see that he was badly bruised. Bruce, speak to me, she cried. To make her feel better, Bruce forced himself to smile. He sat up with difficulty and remained in front of her. Madison turned her back to him and began to untie the rope from around his waist. She didn't ask why he was there because she knew who had put him there. Neither did Bruce ask how she had been caught because he knew who would have been behind it. There was one person who had put them both there. Their shared mother, Sue. Trigger warning. The following episode contains certain events that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. The rope wasn't tied very tightly. The men may have been careless when they tied them up, or they may have felt that the pair were outnumbered and had very little chance of escaping. Before long, Madison and Bruce had untied the ropes from each other. They then placed them loosely around their wrists and ankles to give the impression that they were still restrained. For a long time, they listened to the people in the next room, who were still talking loudly and drinking. Again, Bruce sat between Madison and the door, ready to defend her from the men. From what they could hear, Madison was their main target, and when their leader returned, he would soon be dealing with her. When's Doug coming? I can't wait any longer. You're gonna have to wait. If he finds out that you've laid a hand on her, he'll probably kill you. Why is he so interested in her? I'm not sure, but I think it goes back to when Ellie Thompson wanted the heart of Ian Weston's woman. The woman got away and there was some bad feeling about it. It was probably Hades who interfered. I can see now that he allowed people to escape. I only wish that I'd caught it on time. Instead, I was fooled by that phony. Bruce was alarmed by what he heard. He looked at Madison and said, We should do something before that guy gets back. Go out and lure them away. 
Rusa's heart was beating extremely fast as he thought about what would happen when Jaguar returned. Madison held Bruce's trembling hand and said, Bruce, calm down. We mustn't panic. Jaguar wants to hurt me, but I don't think he'll do anything straight away. Don't forget that Sue is the person behind us being here, so she'll want to see us first before anything happens, she said. Although there was only small comfort in his sister's words, they managed to calm Bruce down a little. He knew what Sue was like and she wouldn't have arranged for them to be captured without wanting to witness their fate. He knew that she liked to feel powerful, and that watching her children suffer would kick her. Madison was sure that there was something else in their favor. Jaguar will have a lot of resentment toward Hades, because he was tricked by him for so many years, she said. He'll want to take revenge on him, so I expect he'll use us to attract Hades here. Also, when Sue comes... There's a chance that Ian will be following her. Although Jaguar and Sue were their biggest threats, they also brought them their only hope. I believe in Ian. He'll find a way to rescue me just like every other time I've been in a sticky situation. He's never failed me before, so I have to believe that he won't let me down this time. Madison smiled at Bruce and said, Bruce hoped that she was right about Ian but he remembered that she hadn't always trusted him. There had been times when she hadn't trusted anyone. If Ian is so omnipotent, how come he didn't stop her from getting captured and ending up here, he thought. Although Bruce had his doubts about Madison putting her faith in Ian, he kept them to himself. He accepted that Ian had saved her before. He had vast resources, so his appearance at the 11th hour was still a possibility. I expect you're right. We'll hold tight for a little longer, he nodded and said. They both stared at the door and waited for something to happen. As they sat there, the time passed by very slowly. The place grew quiet as the men's cursing became increasingly intermittent. Madison and Bruce suspected that they had fallen asleep. Finally, there was some movement outside the front door of the house. It sounded like the door had been kicked open from the outside. Madison and Bruce were shocked when they heard the noise and they tensed up. Their eyes looked even more intensely at the door of their room. They listened for any clues about what was happening. But after the crash, there was only silence. Their minds were frantically speculating about what had happened. Before long, the flimsy door to their room was pushed open, and Bruce sprang to his feet, ready to fight off any threat to Madison. However... When he saw the people at the door, he collapsed and lay limply on the floor. It was Ian. He was there with Francis and several other men. Madison was curled up in a corner and couldn't even stand. She'd been tensed up for a long time and her legs were numb. Bruce looked at Ian in disbelief. Madison had been right, and he had made a mistake by doubting Ian's capability. Madison's eyes were filled with tears as she looked joyfully at the man who wasn't just her husband, but also her hero. The ground outside was covered with snow, but inside the room it felt like the beginning of spring. Madison used all of her strength to stand up and run toward Ian. However, her body was still extremely numb, and she only managed to take two steps before stumbling. Ian quickly grabbed her and pulled her into his embrace. Her hands held his neck as she looked at him without blinking. She still couldn't believe that he was there. You look surprised to see me. Did you think I wouldn't find you? Ian asked. She just stared at him, completely speechless. I'll always find you, he promised. Nothing and no one can stand between us. He held her tightly and he allowed himself to relax a little. His journey to the small house had been tense because he had been worried about whether he would make it in time to save her. I've waited for you for a long time, she finally said. Ian couldn't stop himself from crying when he heard her voice. He clumsily wiped the tears from her face and said, Sorry I'm late. You're not late, but I missed you. Shaking her head, she replied. Ian heaved a sigh of relief and hugged her with all his strength, unwilling to let her go. Francis stood at the door in a cold sweat. 
I don't think that this is the time for romance. This isn't over yet, he thought. Bruce came back to his senses and saw the situation outside their door. He was alarmed by what he noticed. The men from the next room had roused themselves and were heading toward them. Francis told Bruce to be alert and he joined the other men, who had surrounded Ian and Madison and were protecting them. Although the men outside were drunk, they were sufficiently afraid of their boss to do their best to stop the prisoners from escaping. They could see that there were other people with the captives, but they felt obliged to intervene. All of them took out their weapons and pointed them at the intruders. Fortunately, the people Ian had brought were not unprepared. They too took out their weapons and pointed them back at Jaguar's men, causing a standoff. No one moved, and no one dared say a word. Because Jaguar's men were under the influence of a great deal of alcohol, there was a danger that one of them would shoot by accident, which heightened the tension. Ian slowly took off his coat and put it around Madison's shoulders. He held her in his arms and looked coldly at the situation, before slowly moving toward the door. We're just going to leave quietly, he said to Jaguar's men. We're not here to harm you, so just relax and let us pass, Ian said. The men stood by silently as Ian eased through the door while still holding Madison. No sooner had he stepped out of the room when Jaguar appeared at the front door with several men armed behind him. Jaguar squinted at Madison, who seemed small in Ian's arms. Mr. Weston, let's not make a big deal out of this misunderstanding. Let's talk about it. What do you say? He licked his lips and said. Ian looked at Jaguar and his body was filled with anger as he remembered the man putting his hand on Madison. He didn't say anything, and Jaguar thought that he had agreed. He signaled the other men to keep their weapons. He took a step closer to Ian and said, As I said to you when you were chasing my van, it's all because you helped Hades. You made a fool out of me, and I want to get my hands on him. You owe me some compensation for helping him. Ian didn't respond. He had no intention of giving him anything. Jaguar took another step forward, and Ian could see that the men behind him outnumbered his men by two to one. If there were to be a battle, Ian's side would lose no matter how good his men were. Jaguar moved even closer and his eyes fell on Madison's delicate face, which was peeping out above Ian's arm. My proposal is simple. Lend me your wife, and I'll let you leave. That way, we'll be even, he offered. As soon as he finished speaking, there was a gunshot, and everyone's nerves tensed up. Jaguar felt an excruciating pain in his left knee. He looked down to see that he was hurt. Francis and the men behind him took a step forward, and Bruce pulled Madison behind him. Some of Jaguar's men shouted his name, but it didn't change the fact that their boss was in Ian's hands.